so thankful to be able to have this opportunity that we can be together again, blend up our voices and praise to God who truly is deserving of our praise, to be able to have the avenue of prayer to go to him, to thank him for the bountiful blessings that he blesses us with and as well as to be able to make a request known unto him. And now as we turn our attention to the study of God's word, we hope that you will have Bible, pencil in hand, whatever that will be a benefit to you in your study. For those that are not in the auditorium with us, but maybe are on YouTube, on Facebook, or either on the church's website, certainly we're thankful for this opportunity that we have to be able to look into God's word and see the things that are contained therein. So thankful to see the presence of each other. As most of you know, for the past two Sunday nights, we've been looking at a series of studies answering the questions, can the scriptures be trusted? And are they accurate? In our first study, we looked at why it is that we should believe the Bible and looked at a number of reasons as to why that was the case that God is, and for other reasons, we need to believe that the Bible is the inspired Word of God. Last Lord's Day evening, we looked at how that the Bible came down to us, and in that, we looked at such things as inspiration and revelation. Let me go back here, not to confuse you. We looked at what determined the books that were authorized to go into that book of books that we call the Bible. We looked at how that scriptures were transmitted, how that they were written. We have no copies of the original, but we have so many manuscripts of the writings that were taken from the, the original. In fact, after the services, uh, someone made mention concerning the passage in Mark 16, that there are several verses that some translations include that other translations do not. And the thing that those translations gave as the reason as to why they were included, uh, I'm sorry, were left out, was because of two manuscripts that did not contain them. But that's interesting. <laughs> when you've got 5,000 that do contain, or at least 4,998, that do contain those four verses, why do you take two manuscripts that have left them out and start circulating a Bible that thousands, if not millions, of people are going to read? And so we looked at that in our study last week. Tonight we want to look at what the Bible, what, belong, what, what are the books that belong in the Bible. That's what we will be focusing our attention on on this evening. And of course, for the benefit of those that have, or maybe that we have forgot, what we're going to be looking at as we continue in this series is the question, does historical and archaeological evidence support the trustworthiness of the scriptures? We want to look at, does Bible prophecy support the divine origin of the scriptures? To see to what extent is the Bible inspired? To ask how has the text of the Bible or has the text of the Bible been corrupted? To look at can we understand the Bible alive? And that's certainly a subject that many people will answer into the negative, but we want to see if it is possible to be understood. And then, of course, in our final lesson in this series, we want to look at explain them some of the alleged contradictions that people think that they have found in the scriptures. So we've looked at how that the Bible is from God to us. It is a word called inspiration. Inspiration that has brought about the revealing, the revelation of God's will to us in written form. So there are the words of God that have been written. Inspiration meaning God breathed. And so the words have been written. We have the books that have been authorized. 
that make up the 66 books in total of the Bible. We have looked at the transmission of it down through the ages, and we saw concerning the translations, the many, many translations, and how that they fall into different categories. And we need to be careful as to which one of those categories that any particular translation that we're using might have as the motive for it being given as a sometimes supposed translation. We're talking about tonight the canon of the scriptures. Now, I know that normally when we think of that word, we put another in on the word and we make it a weapon, that kind of a canon. But that's not what we're talking about when we talk about the canon of the scriptures. In other words, what are the books that make up those 66 books? How can we be sure that they truly are inspired? How can we be sure that they belong in that book of books? called the Bible. So to begin with, let's look at the definition of this word that we're using, the word cana. The Hebrew word is from the word cana. It is a word that simply means a reed. It's a rod. And in such passages as Ezekiel 40, and especially when you go into chapter 42, you see that it's referred to as a measure rod. And it was used in the days of Ezekiel to measure the temple. And so that's where the word comes from. It's originally a rod or a reed. The Greek word is the same as far as pronunciation and similar in meaning, of course, but a little bit more defined just to understand what we're talking about when we see or hear the word canon being used. It is the straight rod used as a measuring rule and thus qualifying it to be a canon. That is the Greek word. Its meaning is a rule. Its meaning is a standard. For instance, there in Galatians chapter 6, and in verse 16, Paul made the statement, as many as walk by this rule, peace and mercy be upon them. So that is the word in the Greek, the rule, the canon. And so we're talking about a measuring stick, that which is a standard, that which is a rule. And then, of course, our word, spelt the way that it is, comes to us from the Latin word into the English. And it is, as applied to the scriptures, as applied to the Bible, defined as the list of sacred books acknowledged to be the rule or standard of faith and practice. So let us understand what it is that we mean when we use the word canon or when we see the word canon either being used in, a, in an article or maybe even in, in another song. The Hebrew canon, the original consisted of 24 books and they were divided into three sections. Those three sections were the law, the prophets, and the writings, which would include, of course, the books of poetry, such as Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Songs of Solomon, the books that we sometimes refer to as the books of wisdom or the books of poetry. The Protestant canon consisted of 39 books, and they are divided into five sections. And so this is the one that we are most familiar with. It contains, again, 39 books, that is the Old Testament, and it contains five, or is broken into five different sections. And you may wonder, well, what's the difference? Or is there a difference? And no, there isn't. There is no difference in the 24 books of the Hebrew canon 
and the 39 books of the Protestant canon for the simple reason they're all the same. They're identical. Somebody says, well, how come those books? Well, more books in one than there is in the other. Well, in the Hebrew canon, books like 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd sec, uh, Chronicles, and many of what we call the minor prophets were sort of lumped together. And so in the Hebrew canon, there is but just the 24 books, whereas in the Bibles that we are used to, we have 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Chronicles, and each of the minor prophets are distinct and separate, which does make it better for us to understand. The Roman Catholic Bible, it's a Bible that contains seven more books for a total of 46 books in the Old Testament. And they contain such books, and some of these you may have heard of, The Wisdom of Solomon, Surat, Barrett, which is in an epistle supposedly of Jeremiah, Tobit, Judah, First and Second Maccabees, I guess that's probably, or at least it is to me, the one that you hear the most have been referenced to, and then there have been additions made to the book of Esther in the Catholic Bible. Let's look at the Old Testament canon. Normally, at least for the most part, it was written mostly in Hebrew, but by the first century AD, after Christ, Hebrew scriptures were already widely circulated as a complete unit. And they were found in synagogues throughout the Roman world. Now I want us to keep this in mind. As far as the Old Testament scriptures are concerned, by the first century after Christ, these scriptures were in wide circulation and they were in nearly every Jewish synagogue in the Roman world. They were established among the Jews well before the time of Christ. And the Hebrew canon came to a close during the time of Artaxerxes, which was somewhere around 335 to 330 BC, before Christ. So the Hebrew scriptures, the Old Testament, was pretty much established in its entirety, in its completeness, and recognized as such as early as we see here. In fact, the Greek version of the Old Testament, which is called the Septuagint, that was the translation that Jesus spoke from. He used the Septuagint version of the Old Testament. Now let's look at the evidence. Jesus refers to the Old Testament as an unidentifiable body of text. Now, we don't have time to go through all these scriptures, but just for instance, there in Matthew chapter 5, verse 17, he said, Think not that I've come to destroy the law. Think not that I have come to destroy but to fulfill. And then he says, The law and the prophets. So we see Jesus making reference to the law and the prophets. They were a very identifiable book. They were ones that Jesus could refer to and those that would be listening to him would be fully understanding what it was that he was saying. Now, Jesus did not quote from every Old Testament book, but he did quote from all three divisions. And by that I mean the law, the prophets, and the writings that the Hebrew canon would have consisted of. In fact, the, the law, if you ever see that word Torah, just don't let it disturb you to part of you don't understand what it is. Just simply understand 
that it's referring to the first five books of the Old Testament, the books of the law, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Sometimes it's referred to as the Pentateuch, which penta means five, so it's the first five books of the Old Testament that are considered the law, the law of Moses. And two, another thing about Jesus. He spoke of the Old Testament as a unit, as a whole, as one. When he said that, for instance, in Matthew 22 and verse 40, all the law and the prophets. And so he again recognizes, acknowledges the three major divisions that were part of the Hebrew canon of the Old Testament. And then in Luke 24 and verse 44, he said, all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms. So again, there's no mistakes about it that Jesus recognized and saw what we need to understand, and that is that the Old Testament was well established, certainly by his time and even many hundreds of years before Jesus was here on earth. Now, another thing is nowhere in the New Testament do we see at any time Jesus disputing the books of the Old Testament. He does not dispute the human canon, the, the Hebrew canon, with his conversations, with his confrontations with the Jews. There's never a question concerning here's a book that's not or whatever. In fact, he urges the Jews to read, to believe, and to follow the scriptures that they had because he recognized them as being authoritative from God, inspired of God. He used that authoritative phrase, it is written, in reference to quotes that he would make from the Old Testament. And again, we aren't able to go through all of these verses, but these are verses found for Jesus in reference to an Old Testament practice or law said it is written. So he acknowledged the authority of the things that were contained in the Old Testament. In fact, Jesus rebuked the Jews for their ignorance when they did not know those scriptures, know those Old Testament passages. Take, for instance, in Matthew 22 and verse 29, Jesus answered and said to them, You are mistaken not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. This, of course, was Jesus in conversation with the Sadducees concerning the resurrection, how they had proposed to him a, a hypothetical situation of a woman. And one of the things that the law stated about a woman marrying her husband's brothers and bearing seed after him, of course, the Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection. And this is the statement that Jesus made says that you are mistaken. You do not know the scriptures. And obviously the scriptures that he would have had reference to would have been the Old Testament. And Jesus refers to these books in his teaching. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, 1 Samuel, 1 Kings, 2 Kings, 2 Chronicles, Psalms, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Jonah, Zach Micah, Zechariah, and Malachi. He makes quotes or makes reference to those books. If we put, put everything together concerning what we see in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John that he taught, and so he refers to the Holy Scriptures, in fact, at least 82 times in his teaching. 
So that shows his acknowledging of the scriptures of the Old Testament and the books that made up the Old Testament. And he spoke of these Old Testament people by name. Adam, Eve, Abel, Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Lot's wife, Moses, David, Solomon, Elijah, Elisha, Jonah, Isaiah, Zechariah, and Daniel. In fact, he spoke of the prophets as a group of inspired men. And two, Paul acknowledged the Hebrew canon that was written for our learning. Remember that in Romans 15 and verse 4, whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. So it's written for our admonition. And it's in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 that Paul gives in the first 10 verses a pretty good summary of many, many years of Israel's history. And then he concludes that in verse 11 when he says, G I think I put the wrong verse down now. Or at least I added, <laughs> I added Matthew 22, 29 to it. But it says, now all of these things happened to them as examples. And they were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the ages have come. I apologize for that. And also he said it was profitable for doctrine. The passage, I hope that all of us can quote by heart. Second Timothy 3, verses 14 through 17. But going back to verse 14, he said, concerning Timothy and the things that were true of him, he said, you must continue in the things which you have learned and be assured of knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from the childhood you've known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. And then that part that we ought to memorize is all Scripture is given by inspiration of God, and it is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped, unto every, or for every, good works. So we see Paul acknowledges the Hebrew canon. The apostles and the New Testament writers, they frequently quoted from those books that make up the Old Testament. And here are just a few of those. And of course, one of them I left out on purpose was Acts 2. Of course, I'd say we're probably the most familiar with that one because it's in verse 17 through 21 of Acts 2 that Peter quotes Joel to serve as proof of this being the explanation for the things that have happened here on the day of Pentecost. In Acts 2, Peter quotes from Joel. So if we're kind of curious as to what books of the Old Testament were quoted the most, well, here we go. Isaiah was quoted 419 times in 23 books. And I'm talking now about quotations of the book, the Old Testament, quotations that are found in the New Testament. Out of the 27 books that make up our New Testament, Isaiah is quoted some 419 times in 23 out of 27 of those books. So you get how I've got them listed here. Psalms, 414 times, 23 books. Genesis, 260 times in 21 books. Exodus, passages from there are quoted some 250 times in 19 books of the New Testament. Deuteronomy, 208 times is quoted in 21 books. Ezekiel, 141 times in 15 books of the New Testament. Daniel, 133 in 17 books. Jeremiah, 125 times in 17 books. Leviticus, 107 times in 15 books. Numbers, 
73 times in four books. And generally, they're all quoted from the standpoint of like what we read there in Acts chapter 2 and verse 16. It is written, or this is that. And the quote from the Old Testament is made. Now, let's look at the New Testament. And it's canon. Liberal scholars claim that much of the New Testament wasn't really written until the late second or early part of the third century after Christ's death. The Roman Catholic Church claims that they delayed making the canon of the New Testament set in concrete or legitimate until the late 4th century A.D. But here's what we need to understand. That after each book of the New Testament was written, it was circulated, and it was read among Christians. And they were considered authoritative. In Colossians chapter 4, verse 16, now, when this epistle is read among you, see that it is also read in the church of the Laodiceans and that you likewise read the epistle from Laodicea. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 27, I charge you by the Lord that this epistle be read to all the holy brethren. So what we're seeing then is that First and second century witnesses verify the fact of these books being spread, these letters being spread to in the written form in which they were made. We sometimes refer to these men as the church fathers. I think I mentioned them last Sunday night. Not that they are inspired, not by any means. But these are men who wrote of, a, of historical significance. And I won't go over each one of them individually, but here they are. And here we see that their lifespan went through, many of them, through the latter part of the first century into the early part, maybe the middle part of the second century. And what I want us to understand by this is that even in the second and the third century, they were witnesses to the spreading of the word. And that takes forms in, in the form of these individuals. And here's why it's of significance. I won't say it's important, but if, if we're trying to establish really the trustworthiness of the scriptures with ourselves, or maybe even trying to establish them with someone else, these things may be of significance because these men, call them church fathers or historians or whatever, their testimony shows that the New Testament books were widely circulated, read, and they were in general use among churches not long after they were written. In fact, I said this last Sunday night, and I want to say it again while we're on this point, while we see the names of some of these men. These are not by any means all of them. If all of their writings were taken and put together, you would have all of the New Testament able to be recreated through their writings. All of the New Testament, with the exception of four verses. And as I said, these are men that wrote in the first century, the second century, the third century. Now, what about the Apocrypha? <laughs> and that's just a big word for those books that we talked about a minute ago that are contained in the Catholic Bible. And here they are. And we see the dates of most of them. 
through all before Christ. And so much of what the Catholic Bible, in fact, all of what the Catholic Bible is, with very few exceptions, is found in the Old Testament. All of these books that we see here, all of these letters. So what about the Apocrypha? What about these, some people want to say, the missing books? And some people, of course, want to claim that, well, these belong, these belong in our Bibles. But, you know, why are they missing? Well, the Apocrypha was rejected because they were never sanctioned or quoted by Jesus. Now, if you remember the slide I had on just before, all of those books, all of those writings, all of those documents appeared before Christ. So they would be at least there to be known and to be recognized if they were authoritative by the Jews, much less Christ. But that's my point. These books, not a single one of them, were ever sanctioned or quoted by Jesus, nor by his apostles, nor by any other writer of the New Testament. They was never a part of the Hebrew camp. The Jews, recognized them to be false. They recognized them to be bogus. And they were rejected by those men that we have listed on a couple of slides back, the church fathers. They too rejected and never in any way endorsed a single one of those books or documents. It really wasn't until the 4th century A.D. that these apocryphal books were placed alongside the canonical books, those that were considered authoritative. Right, right about 397 A.D. after the death of Christ. And yet they were still in dispute centuries later. So we see what we're dealing with here with the Apocrypha. And it really wasn't until the Council of Trent, and that took place in 1546 AD, that the Roman Catholic Church officially declared those books and those documents on equal par with the other books of the Old Testament. And those books being included, think about it. It certainly made it convenient. It provided a convenient way for Catholics to support their little pet doctrines, which certainly lack support in the authenticated books of the Old Testament. And it certainly did not support them for the very simple reason that a lot of things that were written in those books and in those documents were clear, flat out contradictions of what was contained in the books that were considered to be inspired or authoritative. See, the extra books, well, took that away too far. The extra books do not claim to even be inspired. That's another reason that we would do well to reject them. And one inspired book, if we're dealing with inspiration, as we said in last week's lesson, we're dealing with God breathes, God's revelation. Does God contradict himself? No. But these books that are called the Apocrypha they contradict. So therefore, that's another reason, a very good reason, that they need to be rejected. But you might ask the question, well, you know, just exactly what is the criteria to determine? Well, I mean, I'm, I'm one step ahead of it. Another thing 
as far as they're being rejected, is that they even contain historical inaccuracies. They're not even accurate historically. And of course, as we said, inconsistencies, contradictions with, with God's word. Realizing all of this, we must do really what so many have done. And thankfully to say that there have been many Catholics in the past who also have rejected these extra books as being books that are uninspired of man. And because of that, they have no part with those scriptures that are inspired. In Revelation 22, verse 18, we read, For I testify to everyone that hears the word to the prophecy of this book. If anyone should add unto the things that are written in this book, the plagues shall be added. The plagues that are written in this book shall be added unto him. And if anyone takes away from the books, from the words of the book of this prophecy. God shall take away his part from the book of life, from the holy city, and from the things that are written in this book. They need to be rejected. They ought to be rejected. And I'm thankful that they are rejected. Although certainly they may surface, and in conversations that we have with people, they may surface. We need to be aware of it. But we need to be aware of why they are not in the canon of the, either the New or the Old Testament and understand that in the reasons as to why they're not there, here's the reasons. Any inspired book is absolutely infallible. It's airless in its facts, in its doctrines that are presented. And that's what we have in the 66 books that compose the Bible. Another criteria is that an inspired book must present only holy and pure doctrines. And that's not true of some of those books of the Apocrypha. They advocate immorality in some instances. Another criteria is that an inspired book should reflect the characteristics of God. He's omnipotent, meaning that he is all-knowing. He's omnipotent, meaning that he is all-powerful. And he's omnipresent, meaning that he's everywhere present. And those books of the Apocrypha are, some of them contain references to God that strips him of either one or more of these divine characteristics, these divine attributes. So an inspired book should reflect the characteristics of God in such a way as fulfill prophecy and accurate statements with regard to whatever it's speaking of, whether it's geography, whether it's astronomy, science, math, psychology, all of the areas of knowledge, to the extent that it makes reference to these. If God is the creator of both the world and man, he could not make an inaccurate statement about them. Since God is the source of absolute truth, then one inspired book cannot contradict another. The criteria is that they have to be written by inspired men. They had to be written for the purpose of instructing the people of God. They had to be recognized by the people of God as authoritative, genuine, legit. They are inherent. They are true. That is, that they are essential. They are necessary as well as true. And they are being preserved by the providence of God. So, 
Here is the book of books that we call the Bible. As we said a moment ago, it contains a total of 66 books, 39 of which are the Old Testament, made up of the books of the law, the first five. Then there are the history books that we have of the children of Israel. And God, of course, having chose them as his appointed people in order to bring about the fulfillment of his promise that mankind would be redeemed through the seed of woman. That the seed of woman would bruise the heel of the serpent. I'm sorry, that the seed of woman would bruise the head of the serpent and that the serpent would bruise the heel of the seed of woman. So the history of the children of Israel bears that out. It brought about the fulfillment of the promise, the three, a great nation, a great land, as well as the promise that through the seed of Abraham, all nations of the earth would be blessed. And then we have the prophets. And aside from the books of poetry, that of Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and the Songs of Solomon, then we have the prophets, and they're divided somewhat for the sake of simplicity into major and minor prophets. And let's don't think for one minute that because a prophet is considered minor, that that means that the things that he prophesied are of no significance. It's just that they are called minor because of the length of the prophecy, the shorter prophecies. But then there's the major prophets, of which definitely Isaiah stands out. He's major, not because he's more important, but because there was more that was recorded, that he recorded concerning the things that he prophesied, as well as Daniel, Hosea, and all of the other uh, prophets that we talk about. And then there's, of course, the New Testament, the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the life of Christ. Then there's the Acts of the Apostles that shows the establishment of the church, how that the church was established throughout the known world at that time, and how did the gospel spread as Jesus gave the commission to the apostles to spread the gospel into all the world. Then there are the letters that Paul wrote, some of those letters to individuals like Titus and like Timothy. Then there are letters that he wrote to churches, like to Corinth, to Ephesus, to Thessalonica. And then there, of course, are the other letters, the letters of the Hebrew, the Hebrew letter, James, first and second John, first, uh, first, second and third John, first and second Peter, Jude. And then, of course, there is that Apocrypha book, which is really a word that doesn't mean the end of time, but it simply means a revealing. And that's what the book of Revelation is. That's why it's not revelations with an S on the end of it. It's revelation, meaning a revealer. And that, of course, was what God inspired John to do, to reveal the message to the Christians, that in their persecution, that if they will remain faithful, their victory can be had through the Lamb. The Lamb that's represented always in the book of Revelation as the one that gives the victory. That same Lamb that you and I worship and serve today. Maybe you're here tonight and you do not worship or serve the Lamb. It was through His blood, because He was a Lamb without spot and blemish, that God was willing to accept His sacrifice, His blood, and use His blood to atone for you and my sin. It was that sinless life that he lived that made him the sinless lamb of God that John declared him to be. Maybe you do it tonight and you've obeyed that gospel, but maybe like we talked about this morning, we've fallen into traps. The world sets men and the devil has traps on every hand for us to succumb to. Let's acknowledge our sin. Let's acknowledge our wrongdoing and knowing that 
regardless of who else our sin may involve or whoever else our sin may affect, it's first and foremost a sin against God. He's the one that we're going to be standing before in the judgment day. And it's our relationship with him that we need to make sure of, and we can make sure of it tonight. If we can assist you in any of these ways, please let it be known. While together we stand to sing.